Welcome to the American College of Cardiology's Conversation with Experts. In this segment, we're going to bring you the latest scientific information from the Heart Failure Society of America's 2013 annual scientific session. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Dr. Randy Martin. I'm joined by a great panel of distinguished experts. First, Dr. Clyde Yancey. Clyde is Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern University and the Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Marielle Jessup. Marielle is Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the Heart, uh, and, the Heart and Vascular Center. And Dr. Jim Januzzi. Jim is Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and the Director of, cardiac, of the Cardiac Care Unit at the MGH. Glad to have all of you with us. And, you know, Marielle, let me begin with you. Uh, a lot of talk about acute heart failure management, new guidelines that have come out that the society has put out along with the college. What's the science behind these guidelines? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's a great question. As you know, the ACC American Heart Association guidelines for the second time really tried to tackle the management of acute heart failure. And uh, we're proud of, uh, all of us were uh, writers on that committee, and we're proud of, of what we've done. But if you examine the evidence about um, what should be done to a patient with acute heart failure, making sure that you've done all the right things so that they don't get readmitted to the hospital. Right. Um, there's a lot to be done, but there's not a lot of evidence. So for example, how do we give IV diuretics? What dose should we start? Happily, since the last version of the acute heart failure guidelines, um, we have a study called the DOSE study right. that really addressed that. How do we give vasodilators? Who should they be given to? Um, under what circumstances, what vasodilator. We have a study, the ASCEND trial, that looked at nasiratide. It was a negative study or a neutral study. Right. So, so much of what we do in the hospital, other than beginning evidence-based therapy in those patients with reduced ejection fraction, only half of the people that get admitted, we don't have a lot of data. Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, acute heart failure is one of those syndromes that previously was essentially just viewed in the continuum of chronic heart failure. And I think as a consequence, we got a little bit behind the curve relative sure. to the potential of therapies for these patients, assessing their risk, how we manage them, how we judge success of therapies, right? And so we're only now catching up with that. And I think the guidelines are a really important framework upon which we can take those steps forwards. This is a really uh, rapidly evolving area with respect to how we clinically assess patients patients, and as Dr. Jessup said, how we treat them with emerging therapies that might be of greater benefit than the ones that we currently have available. Clyde, your thoughts on, on this? Because I know you were actively involved in this. So I agree with my co-panelists completely, but we should be careful with the language that there's not anything proven to be beneficial for the patient hospitalized, because this is a great opportunity to optimize patient care and really make certain patients are receiving the right evidence-based therapies. And what's remarkable is that even in the absence of a singular intervention that improves outcomes, over time we've seen secular changes that clearly point to better outcomes that are happening, I think in part because we're doing a better job of doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time. So, so explain that to me a little bit more because I understand what you're saying, but clarify that. So you're saying that basically by looking at a team approach, at looking at uh, guidelines or looking at, at science behind some of the things we do that, that are outcomes without a singular, singular thing making a difference, that the total package is making a difference. So this is one place where we do have evidence that when there is conformity to a set of quality measures during the hospitalization, the risk of inpatient mortality is significantly reduced. Got it. And that is one of the first platforms was improving outcomes during the transition of care and in the outpatient space. So that is an evidence-based approach so that there is something we can do, but the something we have to do is multifactorial right. and is focused on education and optimizing care. Mariel. Well, I think we've learned a lot. So the ADHERE registry, which is a long time ago now, we learned that most acute heart failure was solely about giving diuretics. The patients came in, there was a long delay between the ER and them actually Absolutely. getting intravenous diuretics that most people went home with blood pressure that wasn't controlled 
and still edematous. Yeah, so much, we've, not enough weight loss. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've yeah. learned that. So I think from the very beginning, the process has been integrated so that we partner with the people in the ER. They begin to make the diagnosis. We use biomarkers. We identify the high-risk patient. We identify which teams the patient should go on. We identify um, nurse practitioners that the minute we know they have heart failure can start to intervene. So. I agree that we may not have great new evidence-based therapies, especially for our patients with HFPEF, heart failure right. with preserved right. ejection right. fraction, but all of the other people associated with that patient are more knowledgeable and we use it as a teachable moment to begin the education of the patient and the family. So you know, Randy, there's one other really important thing that we've learned and has consistently been seen. That hospitalization is a stamp, a time stamp, right. yeah. and it really is an inflection point and outcomes are not as good afterwards as they were before regardless, and so it really does focus our attention on that patient. Jim, the, the complexities of heart failure, the etiologies and all the various complexities, it's, and, and Muriel has just made a great case for the, the team approach, the rapid identification. Do you feel that, that this uh, approach is transferable to all hospitals and in our country today, or is this really an academic, you know, major medical center yeah. that has to get this message out? I, a simple answer, actually. It has to be. Right. Heart failure is not something that only belongs to an advanced heart failure specialist who write the guidelines. Heart failure belongs to everyone. Mm -hmm. This is the diagnosis of the next decade. Absolutely. There is no question that cardiologists, internists, nurses, family members of the patients who have the diagnosis need to be really skilled in the understanding of this disorder. And, you know, as, as Dr. Yancey said, a heart failure admission is a sentinel moment in a patient's life in the arc of their disease. And unless and until we have better ways to approach their care before the hospitalization, during the hospitalization, and afterwards, it's going to just continue to be the epidemic that we're all grappling with. Absolutely. How, how would how would you say, Mary, let me, let me ask you, how would you say that these guidelines are really going to affect practice, following on what Jim is saying, they have to be, but across the, the spectrum of practitioners in the country? I think, you know, the, our guideline writing process includes general practitioners or our primary care physicians. They get signed off by these organizations, including emergency room um, societies, um, uh, family internist, family practice society. So we value their input. Second, we, we break the process down into what do you do about biomarkers? What are right. the things you're supposed to do in the first 24 hours? We actually have a table that lists reasons why patients may deteriorate and prompt hospitalization as sort of a checklist for people. We talk about the things that have to happen in the hospital. We even have a table that lists the performance measures that we're all being graded on, not just the hospital, but um, physicians are being graded on as, uh, as what we're doing right or wrong for our patients with heart failure. So we've tried to spell it out for everyone. How do you, how do you get this out to the ER doc and to the, um, you know, to the internist who's taking care of the patient? Because, I mean, they're all great, but you know, we're overwhelmed with information. Is there a simple, you know, I hate to sound like uh, Letterman's top 10, but is there <laughs> yeah. a simple way to approach this so that you get the message down when the patient first hits the door? You know, absolutely. And to Mariel's point, particularly for acute heart failure, the guidelines actually are targeted towards those practitioners other than cardiologists, right. other than heart failure cardiologists, because once we get out of our bubble, they really benefit greatly from having a checklist, having color-coded charts, Absolutely. having Absolutely. summaries. And so to your question, we do have a color-coded guidelines. You can see these are the greens, these are the yellows, these are the reds. It's very intuitive. You connect well. We utilize a lot of charts, and we introduce into this guideline for the first time something called GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapy, on one page in one flow chart here is what we know works best. That's fabulous. I mean, you know, you, you, the Heart Failure Society and the Heart Failure teams have done a marvelous job of attacking a complex problem and expediting care. And I think the, the reason I'm coming at it this way is that it often doesn't filter out, again, to the ER docs, the non-heart failure 
cardiologist, the internist. So having something like that is really good. Tell me the name, the uh, abbreviation of that. <laughs> <laughs> it always sounds like a swear word. I know. I'm saying, <laughs> did I hear you right? Yeah. Tell, tell, for some people, well, it is because actually. this will become vernacular for all of the ACC AHA guidelines to distill everything into something called guideline directed medical therapy, Got GDMT. On. Okay, great. Well, super. I've learned from you all again. Thank <laughs> you very much, and thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll stay tuned and come back for more.